Welcome back to the Venetian Conference Center in Las Vegas, everybody. You're watching theCUBE's coverage of VMware Explorer 2024. This is our 11th year covering this event. Mark Chong is here. He's Senior Director for Product Marketing at Broadcom. Mark, thanks for coming on. Great to see you. Thanks so much, Dave. Pleasure to be here. We're going to talk about VMware Live Recovery. We're going to get into it. Uh, it's evolved over the years. It's like a flagship uh, product for you guys. What is, explain to the audience, what is VMware Live Recovery? Why is it so important? And we'll get into how it's evolving. Yeah, I would say the number one thing that people use it for is to just help them with this IT scourge of ransomware, right? Modern ransomware where the old ways of trying to recover just didn't work. And uh, really for us leveraging all the assets that we've got across the VMware portfolio and bringing it together so it's a very unique offering specifically designed for ransomware recovery, but at the same time, I mean, we've been doing disaster recovery for literally 10, 15 years. Right. And so just bringing that into a single solution. So, I want to follow up on that because during COVID, we heard so often from CIOs that our business resilience was basically equal disaster recovery. Yeah. And so we had to evolve our strategy. You've evolved your strategy as well. So like you said, it used to be known for uh, disaster recovery, now it's much more. What specifically did you guys add to the platform to be able to accommodate that? Yeah, um, so we built off of common technologies that's already in our portfolio, but really saying, what are the key requirements of ransomware recovery that's different and unique than the power outages or the hurricanes that we've known forever, right? And so there are a couple of key components to it. One, you've got to have a next generation behavioral analysis engine embedded in. Because modern ransomware is not about scanning for file signatures anymore. So we built that in. Second, you've got to have this isolated recovery environment in which you slowly test recovery points in order to gain confidence that this is actually safe to deploy, or else otherwise you're just going to reinfect production. And finally, we leverage our virtual networking technology with NSX to make this um, ability to change the network isolation in an automated fashion, we brought all that together, right? You didn't need any of that for a disaster recovery in the traditional sense. You absolutely needed it for ransomware recovery. Yeah, I mean, this to me is, and a lot of the big news this week is around VCF and how it's really expanding and evolving and we'll hear some more about that tomorrow for sure. How does, you know, how does VMware Live Recovery really fit into the ongoing vision of VCF? Yeah, so two things really come to mind here, right? First of all, while we uh, are working with customers very closely to help them realize the value of that full private cloud solution, that's VCF, VMware Live Recovery, though, helps protect workloads even if you're just running vSphere and even if you're just running it on-premises or out in the cloud. So first of all, we're going to help protect any of those VMware-based workloads. The second one is this continued theme around taking the broad set of assets that VMware has got and deeply integrating it so that there's even more value. So one of the things that we very recently delivered was an integration with vSAN so that when you're doing the failback, because you now have a local vSAN snapshot, our calculations are the failback can actually accelerate by up to 16x because you're using that vSAN local snapshot. Because you're only bringing back the diffs off that. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, what's so fun about the last few years is we're looking at the unique requirements of ransomware recovery and then harnessing different assets in our portfolio and then by bringing it together, delivering so much more value. So disaster recovery and, and cyber were largely separate domains yeah. um, and have been for years, but again, post COVID, people started to bring those together. You've seen data protection slash backup become an adjacent to cyber. 
uh, and, and even some would argue a fundamental component of it. How, how, are, you, are you able to bring together those workflows and those experiences into a, a, a single experience for customers? What's that like? That was a huge design point for us, right? We wanted to make sure to really think through all of the personas that are in, uh, involved when you get hit with ransomware, when you get hit with DR, right? And there are several. But there is a common persona, right? Which is ultimately that um, infrastructure or cloud administrator who is responsible for bringing the infrastructure, the applications, the data back up, um, they were responsible for DR and they're still responsible for a ransomware attack as well when you got to bring it back up. But in the workflows, we were very cognizant of the fact that they've got to work with the security persona. Um, and so we wanted the workflows that were designed to actually improve collaboration between these two personas, not make it more difficult for them to do their jobs. Yeah, I mean, to me, again, having lived in this world like yourself for quite some time, you start to look at it and go, really it is when the rubber meets the road and how it helps customers understand this. I, I know you guys, have been, you're highlighting a few of those customer stories. Why don't you break that down for us and help us understand how people are been really getting and having great outcomes from that. Yeah, you know, this is one of those where um, I'll, I'll be able to anonymize some customers because no one wants to talk about the fact that, hey, look, I got hit by ransomware and this is what we ended up uh -huh. doing, right? Um, but I, I'm talking to customers that use words like, you guys have given me great peace of mind. You guys and the solution you've delivered, this is a game changer. And what they're talking about is they now have a plan. And when they test it, they're having confidence that if I got hit, or when I got hit, right, um, I, I've been able to recover, right? Um, and so it comes down to the fact that before they were like, maybe we had documentation and it was like that thick of a manual run book and they were so worried about, could I actually execute when the time came? But now because we have the workflows and actually the tools and the ability for them to test outside of their production, their confidence level has gone from you know, somewhere down here to very, very high and um, that's the basis upon which we've seen it really just flip a switch relative to what they think and now have the ability to do. I want to ask you about testing. Yeah. Because again, for years, having also spent some time in this space, organizations, they wouldn't test. They might test failover, but not fail back, yeah. as an example, because it was too risky yep. to test. But it sounds like you've dr dramatically evolved uh, customers' ability to test with confidence, um, so they could tell their board, yes, not only do we have something in place, but we, we've tested it, we test it regularly. Uh, what's the test regime like these days? Yeah. Am, I, am I on to something here that people Absolutely. are actually testing these days? Yes, yeah. yes, so much so. I mean, before it felt like I would talk to customers and the better ones may tell me I test once a year, right? right? Now, um, okay, I'm going to break it down to two parts, right? Even before we get them to a test, we actually will run an automated check of their runbook, looking at the dependencies for that runbook to be effective. We do that every 30 minutes. Now, it's not a full-on test, but it's looking for the most obvious dependencies. And if it finds something, it's going to tell you quickly, right, within that 30 minutes. Now, to get to your question in regards to the actual testing itself, that's where being able to leverage these cloud resources that you're not paying for 24 by seven, only when you're testing, not part of your production, so you're not worried that you're going to somehow impact your production environment. We're seeing customers, we advise them, they should be testing every two weeks, every month, right? And now they're actually doing it because it's not prohibitively painful, disruptive, or expensive. Mm -hmm. So that is huge, huge. Yeah, I mean, I, I know just because I've been able to get some briefings from you and your team uh, leading up to this that Merrick was one of the ones that was like 
sitting there and you, there's actually a case study on your website about yeah. it. So I, I think I can use their name. So yes, yes, that, it is a public case study, yes. Yeah, where they were, they were not even, they were stealing from production to actually do that and yeah. try to do that. Is that something you see as common as like, again, how do you get out of this, you know, bind of resources versus testing and also it's the people asset aspect of those resources as well and what are you seeing from that you know what um, the fundamental shift here is that uh, let's go back to the testing part of it um, if you weren't testing you couldn't have confidence bottom line so even something as simple as that I you're right the Merrick example um, we have a customer out of Europe um, that has also dramatically improved their posture because they've been able to get out from using the production environments yeah. and leveraging the cloud to be able to do the testing. Um, and then also, I think, just the confidence that their replicated snapshots, right, they're immutable. You're not having to worry about um, them being compromised when the ransomware attacks, right? Because that's one of the first things that they go to, okay? So all of that, but what they really appreciate nowadays is that all of the components are built into VMware Live Recovery. You know, could they build this solution on their own? Yeah, they could, but it was, it, DIY, right, is a lot more difficult, and so what they appreciate is that it's all integrated and that we design the workflows for it, so that whether it's the testing, whether it's the failover, whether it's the fail back, in the example I just shared with vSAN, we're really thinking about it end to end. Yeah, and I, I think just diving a little deeper, my geek hat on here, that, that vSAN example that you're giving, it also is the fact that there are, you can go back up to 200 snapshots on right. that, right? Yeah. Right, right. Because I think that gives people that experience and that distance that they can be confident to go and be able to understand, and you're automating that as well, right? Exactly, so with, with the dwell time of modern ransomware being days or weeks, you've got to have that deep history of snapshots available to you, for sure. Um, and uh, it's, it's just uh, fundamentally at the end of the day, right, um, I'm also seeing customers realize that, look, the way I used to handle backups, uh, you still need backup, don't get me wrong, but you can't take that solution and now believe that it's going to be the thing that's going to help you recover when you get hit. So what, you, you said 200? 200. 200, 200. Yeah. so at some yeah. point in time, so that's the max. So you could in theory do eight in an hour if you wanted to, right? And that kind of granularity, is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, you could, you do. You could do every 15 minutes or yeah, something right. of that nature. Some people do every five minutes, it all depends on your, what, how far back you're looking to go, yeah. I think, yeah. I, so, but this, the reason I bring that up is because I want to I want to dig into the business case a little bit. So, I mean, the, the conventional way to think about a business case for a solution like this is, I've got two dimensions that I look at. The frequency of an event, you know, which leads to the probability and the impact. The frequency you really can't control, it's going up, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. But you can control the impact, and the impact, the measurement is, the, I guess like the reduction in an expected loss, so like insurance you know, people would say, all right, we're going to expect a loss of X every 10 years, and then it was five years, and it was yearly. Right. So presumably that's the dimension that you can have an impact on. Yes. And you've got a number of, of customer examples. Have you been able to, even if it's anecdotally, or subjectively been able to sort of get a sense as to how you've been able to reduce that, that, that impact? Yeah. Um, if you look at different estimates out there, right, we'll see that the total cost of a ransomware breach is on average somewhere in the range of about $4 million. Now that includes the direct business impact of losing your applications, but it also factors in like just the productivity impact, and then it goes a step further in regards to even you know, uh, an estimate relative to reputational impact as well, okay? So let's just use that $4 million number, right? If we're able to help a company even uh, reduce from what could have been 
three to four weeks. I mean, it sounds like a long time, but I'm absolutely hearing stories about that. Yeah. Down to days to recover. You know, I don't have the calculation right off the top of my head, but you can imagine the magnitude there, right? Um, and I've been talking to customers where if they can't recover within a reasonable amount of time, it is, I, I, I don't think it's hyperbole to say, it is an existential threat for them. Because at some point, your customers will just be like, forget it, I can't trust you anymore, and so I'm going to take my business elsewhere. So that's, you know, um, I, I've definitely been hearing stories at that magnitude. I mean, uh, just very, Simplistic back in the math. If you if it takes you, you know, four weeks to fully recover. Yeah. I mean, it's it's, it's obviously going to be a curve. But let's just make it simple. Simplifying assumption: million bucks a week for a four million dollar loss. If you can compress that down to days. Yeah, absolutely. You do the math. You're saving. And and I mean, that's that's huge. Yeah. In terms of productivity, especially. I think that's the biggest. I mean, hit to it was probably last year I remember reading an article about a regional hospital in the U.S. that literally had to shut down because they just could not get their operations back up and running. And let's just for a moment set aside the business side of it. I mean, imagine the human side of it where you had to literally tell their patients that they could not care for them anymore. Yeah, and there's also regulation sides of things as well. And right. like I, we had, heard anecdotally about a large financial services company that used the service during that whole CrowdStrike thing, which yeah. seems like, that that seems like a, a something that's under, under, I guess you could say, estimated is how do you really push the button before things get bad? Is that something where you're leaning into and saying, hey, here, not only that, we know you have known goods here, let's go now before that. Is that se would seem like a... You absolutely do have to be proactive, right? I, I mean, if uh, you hadn't uh, captured deep enough snapshots or really kind of get all this set up ahead of time, it is a little too late once that first ransomware hits you, right? Um, but what other alternatives do people have nowadays? Like, there will be times when I talk to customers, they're like, well, I have cyber insurance, cyber security insurance, right? Or cyber attack insurance. I'm like, great, you absolutely should have that. But the trends that I'm hearing about is that the premiums are increasing very, very rapidly, and the requirements to even qualify to get a payout are becoming more and more strict. And so, you know, that needs to be a part of the puzzle, but it can't be the only thing that you rely upon, right? Um, and then the final thing when I'm talking to customers like that is like, hey, you got the payout, that's fantastic, but if you didn't have a way to actually still recover your data and your applications, you know, that, that payout isn't going to really get you back up and Yeah, running. and frankly the best insurance is if you can compress your, your, your recovery time um, and minimize the lost data. So again, back to basics. RPO and RTO, recovery yeah. point objective, recovery time objective. Yeah. Those are kind of geeky yes. terms. Somebody said to me once time, you have to speak in those business terms. I'm like, those aren't business terms. Recovery point <laughs> objective is how much data do you want to lose, right? Okay, and people say, well, I don't want to lose any data. Well, how big is your checkbook? Because yeah. right? there's no such thing as RPO zero. If you, know, you get disasters and earthquakes and fires. But anyway, you can compress that down to minimize the amount of data loss. And then recovery time, we talked about earlier, the time it takes to get back yes. online. Yes. You know, in a, in, a, in a fashion that is trusted. Yeah. Right? And that's, those are the two dimensions that you're attacking here, yeah. right? So we typically tell our customers that if your goal is to protect against ransomware, keep your hourlies for 24 hours, keep your dailies for at least a week, keep your weeklies for a month, and keep your monthlies for at least six months. That kind of strikes the balance between like, I'm paying all this money for storage, because I could keep, I could keep, you know, uh, uh, by the minute snapshots, right? But imagine the, the bill that you've got from a storage point of right, view. Right, so right. that's our very common advice to strike that balance. So what's the buzz at Explore this year? What are you guys showing off, flexing your muscles? What, any any uh, news you can share? Well, you know, uh, a lot of people here at Explore, uh, they don't think about this 24 seven like myself and my team do. So we just want to tell them about some of the even more recent uh, uh, values and enhancements, I brought up the vSAN integration, which we believe can accelerate the failback time as much as 16 
times relative to what we had before. So we wanted them to know about things like that. Um, but we want to be able to talk about things that are upcoming as well. So uh, some of that is saved for our gen session for tomorrow. Uh, so I'm not allowed to talk about it here. But just imagine being able to even extend the ability to protect um, where customers have maybe air-gapped environments so they can't fully leverage the cloud. Um, or uh, being able to uh, leverage our vSAN capabilities, again, uh, in a greater part as part of the VLR workflow. So stay tuned for that, we're a few hours early but pretty excited about leveraging the full VMware portfolio. A tease your session tomorrow. Where is it, when is it? Oh my goodness, Dave. Oh, sorry. Uh, you you caught spot. me off guard on that okay. one. I'll have to pull uh, that one up. All right, so, well, let, let me know. Okay. And then we'll let people know. Fantastic, right, yeah, fantastic. Great. Mark, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. A pleasure as always. Uh, Thank you, you for having me on. Uh, of course, our pleasure. All right, keep it right there. Rob will be back with me and John Furrier right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE live from VMware Explore 2024 from Las Vegas. Be right back. <laughs>